This week on the 77% Street Debate. Was it really such a great violation to be out in public as a female? And I just felt so betrayed. I grew up in a home of domestic violence. I don't like the person I am because I did exactly what every other thing that my father had done and was still doing and is still doing to this day. Why aren't other men saying, OK, I also come forth, I take full responsibility for what I've done over the years. We need to talk about it, we need to break the silence, take away the shame, and that is the very first step. The 77% is in Johannesburg. Now, around the world, women are fighting for equality. But in this country, women are also having to fight for their safety. That is because South Africa is one of the most unsafe places in the world to be a woman. Now, the statistics show a woman is murdered here every three hours. This country has one of the highest rates, if not the highest rate, of violence against women. On today's street debate, we're asking the question, why? Why are women being victimized in this way? I'm joined by my panel today, and I'm going to start off the conversation uh, with Jackie. Jackie, tell us what your experience was. Um, so, Christy, my experience was a gang rape when I was 18. This is 2007. Um, we went to a club with a group of friends and little did we know that we were going to be coerced into a room upstairs inside the club and a bunch of men came in and I was gang raped there. That's my first um, encounter with sexual violence. Right. We'll come back to you, Jackie, because I do want to establish you in the conversation as well, Tracy. What has been your experience? Christine, I grew up in a home of domestic violence and as a child... I knew that I never wanted to live a life like my mother. I wanted my life to be completely different, and it wasn't. Um, I found myself in an abusive relationship and being beaten up at some point in my life. Did you know many other women in the position that you were in? Certainly not when I was growing up. I wasn't aware of anybody else having the same experiences I was having. Obviously, um, now I hardly know a woman who hasn't had some form of trauma or abuse in her life. Right. Begasisa, I want to bring you into the conversation right now because we've invited you on here. You, you have told us that you were a former perpetrator of violence against women. Tell us what exactly that means. Well, at the age of 16, I went to see my girlfriend where she, she was staying. But the idea was, quite simply, to take them home so that we could have sex with them. They were our girlfriends, but we never discussed whether they had permission from their parents, whether they were willing to do that at that particular point. And, and, and then we, we took them, literally against their will. We were armed, no, no, no firearms, but we were armed with uh, uh, knives and sticks because we're in the villages. So, but it comes, it goes back to the time when I was 10, right. when my brother molested me. So I grew up with this idea that sex is something to be taken and not negotiated. Right. Okay. We'll come back and pick up on that idea. But I do want to come back uh, to you, Jackie, because were you angry? I just want to understand how, how you felt, how you dealt with, with what you experienced. At that point, I felt like, did I really do something wrong by deciding to go out with friends? Mm. Was it really such a great violation to be out in public as a female? And I just felt so betrayed by the friends and also the perpetrators. And I felt like, are we ever going to be safe in any social right. space? Right. And I think I still struggle with that even today because the rape happened at that time. And then later on in life, when I was at a job, I got raped at a photo shoot. Um, and I was traumatized for life. Then yeah. going into adulthood where you start dating um, men who are narcissists, who are um, socially, um, they have no social compassion. They don't care about your body. They don't care to ask you if you want to have sex or not. They, they feel entitled, more especially if they hear that you've got a history of sexual violence. They feel like, oh, well, you've done this before. It's not foreign. So why should I be asking permission when everybody else has been taking? So throughout the years, I think 13 years of my life, um, I have struggled with just understanding what is consent, how do I give it, how right. I, when do I take it back as well. Exactly. And then you're in a relationship where consent now becomes a huge issue. Did I give you permission to sleep with me when I was on my period? 
did, how would I say no? Um, it's things like that right. that I still struggle with when it comes to the issue of sexual violence. Right, Tracy. Help me understand if, if you at some point thought about the person that you were in a relationship with, why they felt that it was okay to do that. Well, the, the, the man who beat me up um, had a history or has a history of violence, and I didn't know that at the time because a perpetrator doesn't come out and beat you up on the very first time you go out on a right. date. There's a whole grooming process that's involved. So we talk about the cycle of abuse. There's definitely that, um, that sort of buy-in. And by the time that you are first beaten up, you are already invested in this relationship. So I didn't know that he was an abusive man. So, and that is without victim blaming, yeah. because I take no responsibility yeah. for that, for being beaten up. It was entirely the perpetrator's decision. Right. Let us talk about victim blaming. Um, what was your experience with having to open up? I mean, your story was made public. It made headlines in this country because of who you were. Um, perhaps you will introduce that to some of our viewers. But just tell us about how society reacted when you walked around in public and people knew your story. What kind of things would people say to you? Um, because I was a public figure on radio and television at the time that I was beaten up, it became public almost overnight. I didn't realize that that was going to happen um, because I went to the police station, I laid charges and, and I took the process to court because that's what I think you should do. But as far as victim shaming goes, no one ever said anything to my face, but I'm very aware that victims even to this day yeah. are blamed for what happens to them and I find that shameful right. because it's not the victim's fault. Did you ever find yourself in a situation where you felt you were being victim blamed, Jackie? I think now with an era of social media, I get it more often. Where if I were to post something that speaks about rape, somebody would say, but you never took your rapist to court, but you're still talking about it. So what is, what's the intention here? Um, can you even show us evidence of that alleged rape? Is there a video? Can we see it? Um, People is, say these things. They do say it. Um, so it, it becomes so bad because of social media mm -hmm. and you can't really always ignore it because it's just in your face. Because I do want to come back to you um, because you, you talked about um, the young woman that you had the encounter with and you said you didn't necessarily go to prison or anything of the sort. Um, but I just wondered today uh, with where society is, right? Do you feel men just have the upper hand when it comes to violence against women, that men can do this and, and get away with it? You're imitating what you see around you. Okay. So my father will bring his girlfriend home when my mother was there, apparently, uh, allegedly married. My father was violent, will beat up everybody. My father will verbally abuse everybody. So. As, as a youngster, I was like, okay, this is how life is. This is what, if you are a man, this you are in you charge, do. and yeah. being in charge, you induce compliance. Okay. You know, and you tell your, your, your mates what you did. They were like, yay. So you get the cheered on when you yes, tell your mates? Yes. I'm just trying to understand, for instance, the men who would have violently gang raped Jackie, right? just trying to get into their heads. Can you, can you step in for us and help us understand why, why men would do that? Why, why men would think that is okay to do to a woman? Well, I, I'm not surprised what Jackie was saying. Uh, where, where I grew up, we had a game uh, called Stimela. Stimela as in the train. It was called Stimela as in the train because men, young men will queue up outside a house to rape a woman. It was never called gang rape, it was never called anything. It was called Estimela. I, I, I never participated, I never did it. Okay. But it was just hygiene than anything else. I want to get back to Jackie because you seem to have resonated with when he talked about Estimela, the train. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, when I reflected on it later on, just to understand in my head, how was I um, actively involved in this, you know, for lack, for lack of a better word. I, I realized that for them it was a game. It who has the longest stamina, who had the raunchiest things to say to a young child, who was more entertaining because they wanted to show off amongst each other, um, who had the loudest voice, who made me cry more, um, who made me scream more. So it was like, I can do better. You didn't do enough. And then the next one would come. And then this one will be like, oh, you got tired. I've got greater stamina. 
And they don't care if you live. They don't care if you run out of breath. They don't care if there's blood everywhere. As a matter of fact, it's like, we want to see more. We want to see more of your tears, more of you screaming, more of your blood, you going in and out of consciousness. That's what we want to see. And every time something like that happens where I lost breath or I was unconscious, you could hear them laughing. Like, oh, you really did a number on her. That was really good. And then somebody would say, oh, no, no, I'm back. It's my turn now. And then they would fight to come back. And you're sitting there in a state of, am I dying or am I alive? And I actually wish that I was really dying in this moment. So what he's saying is, is completely right. That's what they did. Right. Etienne, I'll come over to you now. I mean, you've, you've been listening to, to, to everybody speak here. You're a psychologist. Yeah. Help us understand. When I listen to Jackie, when I listen to Tracy, and when I listen to Becky, what I, what I hear is that society creates scenarios in which this stuff becomes acceptable. And in a lot of situations, becomes not just acceptable, but encouraged. Um, and I, I mean, I want, to, I want to be clear that this is not just, uh, that this is, this is not a mental health issue, right? right. It's important to, to recognize that this is not men mentally ill yeah. people yeah. Uh, as, as we understand them who are doing it. It's not your psychopaths or your antisocial people. Yeah. This, is, this is everyday people, yeah. right? Yeah. But the culture that surrounds us, mm. uh, the, the culture that surrounds men, yeah. not just in South Africa, but around the world, is one which says this sort of behavior is okay. Yeah. And Begsy, so I'm going to come back to you because... You, at some point, reflected on your actions and, and you went through this process of reforming. Um, just, just tell us how that came about. It almost took a lifetime. Um, but when I was, was, was much younger, I always wanted to not to be like my father. But when I became an adult, at some stage I realized around 1997, I was like, I don't like the person I am because I did exactly what every other thing that my father had done and was still doing and is still doing to this day. So I went for, for counseling. It took me two years. I keep telling people that I was being taught how to be a human being. Right. And, and, and they don't believe me because what I wanted to achieve as a young man was a simple new start, a new family, you know, with a little bit of kids here and there and, and a happy home, which was never, ever going to be possible when I was still carrying the baggage from, from my childhood. How do women take back the power, Jackie? How do we, because we're hearing it's a man's world, right? They play these games with the bodies of women. How do women take back the power? I think our governments need to really start gearing up for women who want to come out. Yeah. Because we need safe havens. Okay. We need places of um, a comfort and, and mm. legal assistance as well. Mm. If you, you want to report yeah. a case, that should be easy for us to do. As opposed to us going to the police station and also feeling violated just being by the police station. Right. Um, our police, what frontliners, the people who work at the police station, should be more educated on how to deal with these issues and how to treat women yeah. in those spaces. Because women come, come back from police stations feeling like victims again, or even worse, getting raped at the police station while you're there to report right, a crime. Right. So it is really sort of a, a community okay. thing to get a woman out of a violent um, relationship, whether it be domestic or in right. work. But speaking up is always okay. the best solution. Um, we're still talking about making South Africa a better place for women. Um, can you maybe talk to us about what could be done in the kinds of places in the villages like you grew up in, um, how we, we fix the culture so that men stop playing stimela, that game, so to say? What, what society needs is it's a, it's a new man. It's a new way of understanding what it means to be a man because the definition that we grew up with, not only does it not work for our constitution, if at all, it does not work for our partners. Yeah. Women are not our possession, but our partners. We, humanity, we are born of a woman. Yeah. So we need to, to start almost a new culture yeah. that regards women as nothing other than human beings. Right. Etienne, I do just want to come back to you here. Um, uh, so, I mean, men have to sort of break out of that, that culture, right? 
um, from your psychological perspective, um, from a young person who grew up with Begasisa's experience, how do you break that cycle? So the, one of the most important things, and this is, when we talk about toxic masculinity, this is, I think, what lies at the core of it, right, is that we as men are taught that we're not allowed to show vulnerability, we're not allowed to show emotion, we're not allowed to show weakness. And so when we feel any one of those things, we express it as anger, as violence, as aggression, as hostility, right? And so what becomes really important is normalizing the fact that boys, men, males are allowed to be human too. So we're, we're coming to the end of the debate. Um, just what is your message to a young woman today um, who's experienced some of what you've experienced? How do we take back the power? I think we as women are doing whatever we can to keep ourselves safe. You know, we don't walk on the streets after dark. Um, we lock our doors. We do everything to keep ourselves safe. And I'm often asked that question, you know, what should women do to look after themselves? Well, we're doing everything we can. And if you don't mind, if I'd rather actually answer that question with saying, you know, I, uh, where are the men? Where, where are the men? That's what we really need. Yeah. So who's going to stop bad male behavior? Yeah. Because we woke up during lockdown in South Africa to the news of a woman, another woman being murdered and being left hanging from a tree. Now, While where was, was the outrage yeah. Yeah. from men? Because men yeah. say to me all the time, but I'm not, a, I'm not an abuser, I'm a good man. Well, where are the good men? We need those men to talk out because we as women are doing whatever we can to empower ourselves. Right. Okay, so a message to men there. Jackie, what is your, as we close this debate? I think in the same ways where we host conferences and we have conversations and we, we, we research and we read up on abuse, men should do the same. Um, I've never seen a man who says, I have, I have done this, except, well, Becky here today, who, who openly said, okay, this is my responsibility, this is what I've done to rehabilitate myself. But why aren't other men saying, okay, I also come forth, I take full responsibility for what I've done over the years. This is the way I'm going forward and this is how I'll educate the next boy child. Can okay. I add slightly oh, Yeah, sure, 18. Um, so I think, uh, I think what Jackie's saying is, is, is of utmost importance, right? It's things like sexual harassment, yeah, right? Exactly. It's things like catcalling on the street. Yeah, yeah. All of these things contribute to the culture. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of stuff that, that, that needs to be rooted out as well. That you know, the so-called locker room talk is yeah. no longer acceptable. Yeah, yeah. It never should have been. It never should right. have been. Tracy? So I think Etienne is right. We need to we need to talk about it. Now, Jackie and I have both written books about our experience, as has Becky Sisa. And I think that for us was um, a very powerful step in our healing process, is to take control of our own stories. And when we write our stories, we don't do it to share our shame. We write our stories to give permission to other people to tell their story. So I think that that's a very important part of the healing process. And I think that answers your question about how do we empower ourselves as victims. And I think we need to talk about it. We need to break the silence, take away the shame. And that is the very first step in the healing process. And that does it for our street debate here in Johannesburg. And of course, this conversation doesn't end here. We're interested to hear what you think, what your experiences have been in the country that you find yourself in. Of course, that conversation continues on social media. Bye-bye.